creativity and discipline. I want to, what we want to explore in this section is how do you unlock creativity and while you are still disciplined. Um, people think that these are opposing forces, but you'll be surprised to find that some of the most creative people are also some of the most disciplined. And let's look at the case of blindness, for instance. Do you know 39 million people are, in world are blind? But there are creative ways to tackle this blindness. Sorry, I'm just, okay. So what we have with us today is um, what you see on your screen is haptic footwear. This is a shoe that guides a blind person as they navigate their tra navigate traffic. And this shoe is also connected to your smartphone. So you know it can tell you where you're going uh, via Google Maps. So it's a very creative innovation. And to talk about it, we have Anirudh Sharma, an innovator who has created these shoes. And in conversation with him, I would like to invite Mr. Vikram Gandhi. Um, to explore this theme a little bit more. So over to both of you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for this work. Yep. Thanks very much. I really appreciate the time. And after Sonam's most inspiring uh, talk, I think getting down to uh, creativity and discipline is probably the next good order of the day. So I'm really delighted. Please, Anirudh, come up here. I'm really delighted to uh, share the stage with, uh, with Anirudh today. Um, as was just mentioned, uh, you know, he is uh, a kind of a serial interpreter, a serial interpreter, innovator, and disciplinarian, everything all in one. Um, so the, the, the topic of today, maybe to start off with, Anirudh, is let's take the, the, the shoe that was just uh, talked about, which was, I think the name of the company you started was Lechal. Lechal let's was the product. Yeah, yeah, Lechal was the product. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about Lechal as to how how you started doing that, what is it, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about your other innovations and bridge the gap between what goes on through that head of yours and how to actually make it happen. Right. Uh, so Lechel is, is in concept a very simple idea, uh, and it was born out of a very simple observation while uh, I used to live in Bangalore and used to intern back at a small company. Uh, there were a lot of visually impaired people in Bangalore walking around in an area called Koramangla, and one fine day I was walking, and you see people, uh, this was, there was this guy crossing the road, and he was holding the hand of another person. The next day I go around, I see another person walking around. Uh, he has a guide dog, uh, which is sort of guiding him that, hey, this is how you go from this place to this place. And uh, so these observations kept into, uh, I, had the, I have a habit of, of making uh, design observations like, uh, picking out things that this is a design flaw, this is a problem, this this is something that people are facing on a day basis, what can we do about it? And one fine day we were sitting with a bunch of friends, we were like, hey, we have a phone in a pocket, and the phone is vibrating, and it without looking at the phone screen, you can tell somebody is calling you. It's a way of communicating information that somebody is reaching out to you uh, through a sense of feeling, uh, that is haptics, like sense of touch. So we thought, what do visually impaired people have uh, that is better than the sense of sight? Like their sense of touch, their sense of uh, feeling uh, and listening is so strong that if we use them and, and exploit it, we can create something that can help them uh, go from one place to another. And, uh, and it, it was very random. It's like uh, we're talking to a friend, okay, we said, what is something on your body that you wear on everyday basis that you don't change much? It's something like a shoe or, or a footwear. Uh, can we do something about it? So we took the vibrate. We, we take, took a cell phone, opened it, take a, took a vibrator out, put it in the shoe, and s see how does it feel to feel a vibration in your foot. And we said, okay, it it, it feels ticklish, but can it give information about person uh, uh, to the person that how to go from one place to another? So we made a first prototype. Uh, it the first prototype had these vibrators taken off from cell phones. And, and you just say, you want to go to Vigyan Bhavan front gate, and you are standing anywhere around. So it will vibrate in the foot and tell you which way to go from one place to another. Like if it vibrates on the left side, you just take a left. Uh, if it vibrates it's on the right. some sort of GPS system? Or yeah, what? it's connected kind of to the GPS. So it has cell phone connectivity that talks to the, to the GPS system. Uh, and the real innovation lies here in the way you communicate the information to the visually impaired person. There were a lot of research, a lot of technologies already existing which said, can visually impaired person use headphones or earphones to just listen to Google Maps, what Google Maps are saying. 
and uh, we sort of thought that uh, it would be kind of stupid to to block their sense of hearing that because because when they walk outside they employ their sense of hearing to actually uh, 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 figure out the direction of the traffic so we said let's employ a sense that a person already has and is not being used which is very strong that is sense of touch and sense of feeling so it's a shoe that tickles into your f that tickles I can show it to you offline it just gives this vibration and tells you which way to go in in order to reach a certain direction yeah so so where are you in that innovation right now how are you how so for one thing is to create something like this and how are you planning to scale it so that yeah yeah so it started out as a weekend hack like uh, I, I was a hardware hacker I still am and uh, we were just brainstorming made the first prototype you're the dangerous type <laughs> hardware hacker <laughs> yeah kind of uh, I was getting ideas about this microphone when we were sitting down there but anyway uh, so we created that prototype and what happens when you create a prototype is very interesting you show it to people so we show it to two, two or three visually impaired people and they said this is something we would want to try uh, something we would want to have on a day basis and if you have seen engineers working you know these wires and breadboards hanging out right like the dirty quick and dirty prototypes so it was at that stage and we said are we are a bunch of hackers we've just built this how do we take it to the level that these people can actually use it so bunch of uh, so we posted some of the images and and couple of videos online it got really good press around it like it got viral and and emails started floating in from around the world that hey we want this product can we can we buy it off can we and we were like no we just have a prototype we would love to have this thing shipped but we don't have the resources so around that meeting visually impaired people uh, I said most visually impaired people came from economically poor sections, at least in India. So we said, can you introduce me to rich visually impaired people? So I met a visually impaired person who introduced me to another person who ended up becoming my business partner. And we, I moved to Hyderabad, uh, started a company. Now it's 60 people. Uh, um, during the last four years, uh, there have been several iterations. And it has reached from that stage to a stage that is being manufactured right now in Shenzhen, in China. Uh, parts of it are being manufactured in, in Shenzhen. The assembly is happening in India. We have set up a complete assembly line uh, in Hyderabad, and it's being done. So it's a big team now, uh, and it's going to be out in in next. Uh, uh, we had a lot of delays because of hardware, and hard doing hardware is is really tough. Like uh, the the as uh, in the talks before, startup ecosystem is really booming up in India, in terms of software, in terms of apps. But what about things that are tangible? And and to be to be honest, 70 percent of the world around us. Most of the things are tangible, right? Like, how do you create things that you can feel and touch and making that happen in India? So it took us delays, and f within four years, now we are at a stage that we are bringing this product out in the market. I'll come back to that later in a minute. But, you know, I was just reading over here that apart from that, you were obviously co head of the MIT Media Lab in India. And then you working on a printer that harvests ink from pollution and integrated urine based diagnostic platform. I'm not sure what that means. You may want to explain. <laughs> and a technology-based solution to decrease conflict between human settlements and wild elephant communities. Yeah. How does your mind work to come up with these kind of things? Right. Uh, so uh, one, uh, I think it's a, it's a feature and a bug at the same time. Um, like, uh, I, have, I work in a team with people which likes to stick to a project for not more than seven months. So within seven months, we, we take a take an idea to a, to a concept, to, to a complete implementable prototype, get done with it, pass it on to a team that can scale it up. And that's the kind of uh, ecosystem we are setting up. So the urine thing that you're talking about is, is uh, how many of you had beer last night? Come on, everyone, put your hands up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one had beer last night. OK, that's okay, good. Probably a probably, uh, couple of days before. But so it's a, it was a system that uh, around a bar discussion that we were having, we developed a very small, uh, 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 I would say, uh, add-on to a toilet seat that you would just go, do your thing, and you'd get a feedback that this is how much you've had. And based on your weight, it would... It but in case you had too much, you forgot how much <laughs> you had? <laughs> yeah, this is how much you've had, and you should not drive. So, uh, and over a period of time, it would give you analytics that hey, you have been drinking this much, is uh, last week your consumption was this much. Because you might forget going to a doctor, you might forget taking pills, but you'll not forget going to the loo. So uh, that's the idea. So why not integrate the diagnostics in a place that 
you cannot avoid. So the idea being the same, you modify something that you have to use on a daily basis, whether it be your shoe, whether it be your toilet seat, whether it be your watch, uh, like what Goki does, like it's a wearable in the hand, yeah. So that's the kind of line of thought I've been uh, looking at, yeah. And what about this thing with the wild elephants and? Wild elephants, this, I'll come to the pollution one. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, there's, uh, so during, while we run these uh, MIT Media Lab Design Innovation Workshops, so I graduated and came back, uh, we run this thing called, we go out in the open, we look at the problems. So for example, uh, you go out, for example, uh, you are in Mumbai or you are in Delhi. Uh, when you walk out in the streets, what do you, s in, in a hot summer day, when it's very sweaty, and you take a handkerchief, and you take that handkerchief and, and rub it on your skin, it gets blackish, right? What is that black thing? So uh, that black thing is unburnt carbon in the air. We were talking to a bunch of people. We said, this unburnt thing is causing so much, like you have to go, you have to give your shirts to a laundry. And you know how life in, in, in design and engineering schools work. You don't laundry enough. So uh, what we did was we said, OK, uh, when you go look at ancient India, and still, people make kajal and people make ink by burning uh, soot, by burning things around you. So we developed this printer that, uh, um, that could harvest uh, unburnt carbon from the pollution in the air and use that unburnt carbon, fuse it with day-to-day -day substances like uh, you just add some vegetable oil for the medium and it makes a, pr a printing ink for you. Uh, so all you do is you have a printer uh, and it collects ink from a source that is outdoors. The unburnt carbon is separated from the regular air that comes in. And that unburnt carbon is mixed with, uh, uh, mixed with the, the you, you just mix some, actually you mix some vodka to it. And vodka is a very good medium uh, for converting. So you add alcohol and vegetable oil to it and convert, makes it uh, printing ink. Uh, and this principle is something that I didn't invent. It was being used in, in ancient China, in ancient India for making ink. But how do you retrofit into a modern system that could actually print something like this for you, for an instance? Yeah. So, so then how, I mean, you know, it's obviously you've got, it's a very unique skill set to have come up with all these kind of things. But let's talk about the piece which is, you know, creative minds coming up with fascinating things because it just got your fancy while you were drinking and you said, well, how do we do a urine-based diagnostic system right, or whatever. Right, right. Um, how did you take that and have the discipline to actually make it scalable so it has an impact as opposed to just satisfying your intellectual curiosity. And particularly in the context of, like you said, that, oh, well, we can't stick with one idea for more than seven months, but you really can't really implement an interesting idea and make right. it impactful. It's gonna take you a lot more than seven right. months. Right, right, right. Uh, again, so as, uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, creativity and discipline are opposing forces. It's correct if you put that on the same side of the equation. But actually, they're very complementary. Uh, so generally, when we work in teams, that's what teams are for. Uh, we never let a management team tell us what to do. So we, we create, we build, and we say, this is something that is done. How do you now take it into a discipline? Like for scaling up, you need discipline. You need, you need investments. You need funds. You need teams that can market. You need teams that can sell it. And, and then when it's done to a certain level, you also there's a big chance of failure here. Like you attempt 20 things, out of them 10 work, and out of them three are actually market worthy, and one ends up out there. So it, it's about doing those 20 experiments and, and having one of them, uh, or two of them. That's actually. the classic venture capital investing model, right? Sure, one sure. out of a thousand yeah, thing yeah. works. Or whatever. True, 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 yeah. yeah. But, but for example in Lecha, like how have you, but you transformed from doing and coming up with a very interesting idea to now saying that you're going manufacturing in Shenzhen and you've got a thing in Hyderabad and you have 100 people or whatever you said. Correct, correct. Who's actually doing Are you doing that or you right, move on right. to your next invention and right. someone else is doing it? Sure, so uh, so the company started. I moved to Hyderabad. We started the uh, team. Uh, we became 15 people. And when the team started becoming large enough, I took a sabbatical from my own company and I went to MIT uh, to pursue research. Uh, and after coming back, uh, I still I still remain very connected with the design and the technology decision of the company, but don't involve in day-to-day -day basis of the decision making of the marketing and such, because uh, 
I like to be, you know, it's about, you, you want to keep one foot inside that, but you really want to be honest to your own, own trade, own, own tradition of building stuff. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, the kind of teams that we build, we, we like to have complementary people. Like, for example, uh, we were talking about this elephant problem. There's a big problem, and even in Mumbai, you have leopard problem, right? And in southern India, there's this, the cities are getting bigger and bigger, and the villages and the jungles are getting, the, the j cities and j villages are getting bigger, and the jungles are getting smaller. So because of that, what's happening is a lot of wild elephants are actually coming into cities and, uh, and into villages and damaging crops, killing people and such. And b as a result, uh, the elephants get shot. And the whole sympathy of the world around goes towards the wild elephants. And when you go to those villages, those people have a reason to kill those elephants because if something like that happens with you, if your loved one is killed, your first effect, the first reaction would be to, to, to kill the killer. So we said this problem exists. The government tried a lot of solutions like fencing, electric fencing, which failed. So during that workshop at MIT, we invited a couple of wildlife researchers. And uh, um, around that, we said, what is something that elephants produce that, uh, that can be used as a trigger for a signal that, hey, the elephants are in this uh, 40 kilometers radius? So do you know that when I'm talking right now, I'm talking at a certain frequency. It's between 20 to 20,000 kilohertz. Not to sound too technical, but there are a lot of sounds around us that you cannot hear. They're in infra or ultrasonic uh, medium. So when elephants talk and they send signals, they talk in uh, infrasonic uh, medium. And so we designed these uh, very small uh, infrasonic microphones that listen to uh, the sounds of elephants. So they have a language. So when they're angry, when they are charging on you, they make this rumbling sound that can be heard from miles away. So can we use their sounds that they produce to create a trigger system that can actually alert the entire village that, hey, the elephants are coming. And then what you do is you make a, another infrasonic sound of a danger for the elephant. So what you do is if the sound of the elephant attack is detected, you use an ultrasonic speaker to make a sound that elephants are scared by. So the entire village will not hear that because it's in a spectrum that humans will not hear, but it'll be a communication mechanism between it. So we developed this and we are sort of right now looking for people, looking for partners to actually scale this up. We can actually take this on the ground and implement. So one major thing that we choose projects on and the kind of ideas that they have to be new. Like we don't want to be in the space where 20 other people are working, we're not for that. Uh, we want to do things that are intellectually uh, inspiring and solve uh, existing problems. That's really very inspirational, so thank you for sharing that. And I, I think the takeaway from this discussion, we move on to the next uh, uh, innovator, is really that, you know, the, like you said, you're trying to fill a gap that doesn't exist, which is fascinating. You're using your innovative skills to come up with interesting solutions. But equally importantly, which is what I guess this part segment was, that is to come up with, you know, different ideas and then jump from one to the other. But what you've done is been able to, or at attempting to do, is bring complementary skill sets to really bring the discipline to make it happen. So congratulations, really pri privileged to speak with you. Thanks, Thanks Arun. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>